Welcome to the Dee Dee and David Del Monte Lecture. Today's lecture is sponsored by the Foundation's Del Monte Lectureship Endowment in collaboration with Student Life, Equity and Engagement, and Arts and Lectures. The Del Monte Lecture Series is possible through an endowment established by David Del Monte in 2000 to create a diversity-focused lecture series. David was a student at SRJC in the 60s, earning his AA in 1965. While a student here, he was actively involved in campus life, and one activity in particular really had an impact on him. A speaker that came to campus as a representative of the Communist Party. He says that hearing that speaker in person was an enlightening experience, and one that opened his eyes to diversity in a new way. With their gift, Dee Dee and David hope the annual event will continue to shape minds and hearts through conversations centered in diversity, and that the speakers will continue to have a transformative impact on future generations of SRJC students. Today, I'm honored to present a speaker who undoubtedly has the ability to create a transformative experience here today. Tim Wise is among the most prominent anti-racist writers and educators in the United States. He has spent the past 25 years speaking and training corporate, education, and government professionals on dismantling racism in their institutions. Tim has been featured in several documentaries, including the 2013 film he co-wrote and co-produced, White Like Me, Race, Racism, and White Privilege in America. He also appeared alongside legendary scholar and activist Angela Davis in the 2011 documentary, Vocabulary of Change. Weiss appears regularly on CNN, MSNBC, and has been featured on 2020. He's also the host of the new podcast, Speak Out with Tim Weiss, and the author of seven books. Please join me in a big SRJC welcome for our 2018 Del Monte lecturer, Tim Weiss. As the parents of teenagers, you know, you want to give them a sense of hopefulness rather than hopelessness. And so in order to do that, you have to remain somewhat, um, I guess, upbeat or at least uncynical about the state of the world, even when you might feel like being incredibly skeptical about our ability to sort of get it together and create a more just and peaceful society. But I am trying, like I said, I'm trying to be upbeat, I'm trying to be positive, and I think I have found a positive, although I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure I buy my own bullshit here. So let me just, I'm going to try it out on you, because I could just be fooling myself. And I don't like to lie to myself, but you know, sometimes it gets you through the day too. So this is what I came up with, and it's good news that comes from a place of bad news. So, so the thing is, for like those of us who do anti-racism and civil rights work, the last, you know, eight to ten years, or the eight years of the Obama administration at least, from 09 until um, the beginning of 2017 when that administration officially ended, that eight-year period was a period where our job, those of us who do this work, our job was basically um, to go around and convince white people that racism was still a problem. That was literally the gig, right? Because there were a lot of white folks who, not all white folks, not all white folks, don't get defensive white folks, not all white folks, just <laughs> lots of white folks were of that opinion. The minute Obama won, it was like, sure, I'm glad that's over with. By that being over, they meant racism, right? Because obviously, how could a man of color become president if we still had a racism problem. So for eight or nine years, we had to literally sort of hold folks' hands. I've been holding white folks' hands a long time. I'm white, been white a long time. Almost half a century, been white. And I had to do that for eight years. And if it was exhausting for me, I can only imagine how incredibly exhausting it was for people of color who had to continually raise these issues against a backdrop where an awful lot of white America just couldn't see the problem because this was obviously such an obvious outward manifestation of progress um, that meant white supremacy had been defeated. As I'm sure you will agree, 
patriarchy was defeated in Pakistan when Benazir Bhutto, a woman, was elected not just once but twice to be the head of state in that country. I'm sure you remember the headlines about how sexism had been smashed irrevocably in Pakistan just because a woman was the head of state. And you'll recall before that when Margaret Thatcher won uh, in the UK, same thing, no more patriarchy. And when women were elected in Germany and Ireland and Israel and India and a lot of other countries, still not our country, that sexism was eradicated in all of those places. And if you didn't see that headline, it's because that headline does not exist because the election of a person from a marginalized group says nothing, literally nothing, about the larger structural obstacles facing millions of other people from that same group. But we had to convince a lot of white folks otherwise in that eight or nine years because they really firmly seemed to believe it. So that was exhausting, that was the bad news. So here comes the silver lining. <laughs> Here's the good news. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to do that shit anymore, do we? Yeah, we don't have to convince anyone. There's no hand-holding, there's no, no really, trust me, racism is still a thing because it's so obvious now, at least to people who are even remotely willing to see it, about a 25% uptick in overt hate crime activity just in the last 15 months or so, about 19 individuals murdered by overt white supremacist, white nationalist, neo-Nazis, or others affiliated with this broad base that they like to call the alt-right, but I preferred when they went by their more honest name of white supremacist. I believe in truth and advertising rather than sort of rebranding. So um, we've seen that. We've seen murders in seven or eight different states tied to this far-right movement. Of course, we had the, the uh, Tiki Torch riot in Charlottesville. Because I'm sure you'll agree with me, nothing says white supremacy like a bunch of 23-year-old white boys in khakis and polo shirts marching around with oversized Polynesian candles they picked up at the Pier 1. I'm sure you'll agree with me that nothing says we are the superior race more than that. I joke because one has to in moments like this or else one can become awash with the cynicism and the defeatism. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that there is one silver lining. That is that some of the obviousness is now so blatant that we can put away the 101. Right? We can put away the 101 that says, no, really, we need to think about racism. And we can begin to deal with the reality that I think ever-increasing numbers of people can see both the rhetoric from the highest office in the land and the policy proclamations of that administration and the overt racism. However, as good as it is that we're finally focused, to some extent, laser-like on that, there is still also bad news to go with that good news. Right? Obviously, first of all, an uptick in overt racism is never a good thing, even if it does help us crystallize our vision a little bit. But the other problem is this, and this is what I worry about amid the good news that we're able to see it perhaps for the first time, some of us in a while. The thing I worry about the most is that when you have an uptick in overt hostility like that, like Charlottesville, Virginia last August, like that increase in hate crimes, like those 19 or whatever the number is now, murders committed by far right folks in the past 15 months, when you have something like that happen, it allows all the rest of us, particularly the nice white liberal folks, who would never march around with the tiki torch yelling racial slurs because that's terrible. And those nice white liberal folks who didn't vote for this administration because we knew better because we're not like that, quote unquote, it allows the rest of us to get distance from the problem, doesn't it? It allows the rest of us to content ourselves with the idea that because we're not like that, that we're better, and those are the bad people over there. You know, the Nazis, they're the bad people. The white supremacists, they're the bad people, right? And we're the good people, and that's an awfully dangerous conceit. First of all, if the best thing you got is that you're not a Nazi, you might want to start over again, right? <laughs> like, if that's, if that's your starting point, you might want to rethink your pitch, you know, about what kind of a human being you are. But more importantly, these problems predate Charlottesville, and they predate Donald Trump, and they're going to be here after Donald Trump is no longer the president, whether that happens tomorrow by noon or whether that takes a few more years. One never really does know, after all, right? These problems predate and will post-date this administration and whatever ramped-up level of overt racial hostility and anti-immigrant hysteria 
has been ginned up in the process of this administration. After all, it isn't David Duke, and it isn't the white supremacist, and it isn't the neo-Nazis, and it isn't the Klan that are responsible for the greatest levels of racial inequity that exist in this country. Right? It isn't David Duke's fault, for instance, that African Americans with a college degree are still almost twice as likely as white folks with a degree to be unemployed, even when they majored in the same thing. It isn't David Duke's fault that Latinx folks with a college degree are about 50% more likely than white folks with a degree to be unemployed, even when they majored in the same thing. It's not the Klan's fault that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders with a degree are about 23% more likely than white folks with a degree to be unemployed, even when they majored in the same thing, or the fact that our indigenous brothers and sisters are two-thirds more likely to be unemployed than white folks, even when both have a degree in the same department. Nazis didn't do that. White supremacists, white nationalists, people who call for the creation of a white ethnostate like Richard Spencer and some of those other boys from Charlottesville, they're not responsible for the fact that right now the typical white family in America, not the top 1% or one-tenth of 1%, just the midpoint white family in this country has about 15 times the net worth, the wealth of the typical African-American family and about 11 times that of the typical Latinx family. In fact, white households headed by high school dropouts have one third more wealth on average than black households headed by college graduates. Let me say that again because you won't read about it in the news. White households headed by somebody that didn't even finish high school better off in terms of their wealth than black folks, black households headed by someone who did everything right, stayed in school, finished high school, went to college, graduated from college, still behind. David Duke didn't cause that. The Klan didn't cause that. Overt white supremacists didn't cause that, and Donald Trump didn't cause that. That situation may get worse during the course of the administration, but we can't put that on him, right? They're not to blame for the fact that right now Black folks unarmed are about three and a quarter times more likely than white folks unarmed to be shot by police, even when posing no threat to the officers in question. They're not to blame for the fact that right now, black folks and Latinx folks combined are about 85 to 90% of all the people that are getting locked up in a given year on a drug offense, even though black and brown folks combined are only about 25% of the people that are actually using or possessing illegal narcotics. Black folks four times than white folks to be arrested for weed, even though white folks smoke weed just as often. And we don't just smoke it, we deal it. Now, the fact that we can get an occupational license in a storefront to run a dispensary doesn't change the fact that we're selling the same shit that black and brown folks are still getting busted on the streets of this state and every other state where it's been made legal every day. Right? But only some people are criminalized for the activity, and David Duke didn't do it because he doesn't have a badge and he doesn't have a gun, and he doesn't have the authority of the state. The state did that without any help from Nazis, right? That's on all of us. That's happening on our watch. And you may not be to blame for it, just like I'm not to blame for it, but we have to take some responsibility for the fact that the country in which we live has created that inequity, right? Y'all can come on in. It's not going to bother me. Just find a seat. It's good. It's good. I'm doing my thing. I'm not even noticing you. Once you get out here, I'm good to go. Um, the state has created that inequity because a lot of those inequities have been embedded over time, right? Like that wealth disparity that I mentioned, that 15 to 1 wealth disparity, that didn't just happen overnight, right? That didn't happen over just the course of a generation. That's the result of multiple generations of embedded opportunity for some and disadvantage for others, which has put some households three laps behind in a five-lap race, five laps behind in an eight-lap race, Right? And if I'm a member of a group that's been held back five laps in an eight-lap race, once I get the chance to run, it's going to be real hard to catch up no matter how fast I run. In fact, I can run faster than you, and I'm still going to be behind for a very long time. Right? So we have to take some responsibility and accountability for that because those are the kinds of systemic inequalities over which white supremacists have no real control, at least not blatant white supremacists. Right? And so we can't afford the conceit of saying that's where the racism problem lies, right? Is that part of it? Yes. Is it frightening and destructive? Well, absolutely. But if we limit ourselves to an analysis of the obvious, right, we miss the institutional, we miss the structural. And I would contend 
that the institutional and the structural inequities are killing a lot more than those 19 people that I mentioned a second ago. See, there's a lot more than 19 people whose lives are being lost or fundamentally altered and destroyed in a negative way by systematic racism. We need to focus as much on that as we do on the obvious, the stuff that makes the headlines. It's also dangerous for us to think of this current political moment as a unique break with tradition. Because after the election, that's what you heard, right? We kept hearing people saying things like, well, this is unprecedented. This is not normal. This is very much not normal. This man, he is not normal. His administration is not normal. This is just very, very odd, very abnormal. This is unprecedented. What the hell is really not normal about this? Like, what, what, is, what, is, what is unprecedented? A rich white man getting elected by telling not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown? How is that shit new, right? That's like the oldest play in the playbook of American politics. It's so old that it goes back to the colonies before we even were a country. The whole history of the nation is the history of rich white men telling not rich white people to look out for the black and brown folks, right? So the fact that that's the same game that this individual play, you think Donald Trump's had an original thought? What? Ever? It's a, dude that, it's a dude that inherited a real estate portfolio worth $230 million from his daddy, right? In the 1970s when you could buy property in New York City for a song and a cup of coffee. And then he turned that $230 million into billions. Still went bankrupt six times. Don't know how the hell that happens. I used to get $5 a week as an allowance from my grandmother. I didn't declare bankruptcy once, y'all. But apparently you get $230 million and you don't know what the hell to do with that shit. I don't know what to do. I guess I'll just lose it all, you know? So he hasn't had an original thought. He wasn't a self-made anything, but he conned a lot of people into believing it because as a rich white man, he could look at not rich white people and tell them their pain had a black and brown source. And if their pain had a black and brown source, then they didn't have to pay attention to the way that rich white people pick their pockets every day. Right? So there's nothing new about it. In fact, let's trace the history real quick. Let's go back to the colonies, not literally, that would be horrible, but just for a second, in the historical sense, right? Think about the colonial period, right? A time during which, first of all, I should remind you, there was no such thing as white people. I know that's hard for us to hear sometimes, those of us called white, because we think that we're actually a thing, right? <laughs> with some actual organic history. That's why Richard Spencer can call for a white ethno state and the, you know, the saving of the white race. The white race didn't exist as such. It was not called that. We were not one big happy family. I beg to remind you that in the countries of our origin, those of us now called white, we had spent most of our history trying to kill each other. That's how much we did not consider ourselves one big happy family, let alone one race of people, right? The English hated the Irish, the Irish hated them back, everybody hated the Germans and not without cause, right? Northern Italians didn't even think that Southern Italians were Italians, right? They thought they were these Mediterranean, North African peoples, they didn't even really count as Italians, right? So we spent most of our time fighting each other, killing each other, or alternately looking for the witch. That was the other thing we did in the colonies. We were big on that. Right. That was sort of the history of European peoples, was infighting, killing. We didn't, there was no white race. There was no pan-European unity. But then all of a sudden, in the colonies, 1600s, this term starts to get used. What happened? What changed? Did they discover something scientifically that justified calling all of these disparate peoples with disparate languages and disparate customs who hated each other the white race? No. There was no scientific discovery. Was there some ancient literature they discovered that showed some ancestral or cultural link between all of these disparate peoples? No, there was no discovery. Well, that's not quite true. There was one discovery. Rich white people, rich Europeans at that point in the colonies, made the discovery that they were outnumbered by poor people. That was the discovery. Right? They looked around and they realized that they, the wealthy landowners, were a very small percentage of the colonists relative to the Africans they had brought over as chattel and relative to the European poor people they had brought over as indentured servants. And when you discover, and you can do a little math, that you are outnumbered by poor folks who hate your rich ass and not without cause, what do you do? You better come up with some kind of trick. You better come up with some kind of way to make somebody in that big group that outnumbers you get with you. 
and cleave to your side. So how do you do that? You create this thing called the white race, and you start telling these piss-poor Europeans that didn't have anything, didn't own land, certainly didn't own other human beings, for goodness sake, right, that they actually have more in common with you, the wealthy landowner, than they do with the black person they work next to in the fields every day, right? And so you take these indentured servants who are just one level above slaves themselves, right, and you make them convinced that if they just work hard and they work off that term of indenture, then they can become a landowner, and maybe they can become rich, and maybe they can even own a person from Africa someday if they're really, really good. So you create this thing called whiteness as a way to sucker poor white people now called, poor Europeans into believing they got more in common with rich folks and other poor folks, right? And so what happens? The rebellions that were starting to happen during that time, because see, these Africans and these indentured servants could sort of see the deal. They knew they were all getting shafted. So every now and then they would team up to overthrow aristocratic arrangements like they did in Virginia with Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. There were others, but that was perhaps the most prominent. And so then the landowners say, we can't have any more of that. So they create whiteness. They start giving the European, even the poorest white man, they start giving him certain advantages over anyone who is not considered white. Now they can enter into contracts. Now they can testify in court. Now they will get rid of indentured servitude. No more of that. Now you'll be a free person. Right? Be able to work for whatever contract you can negotiate. And very importantly, they took these piss-poor Europeans, now called white, and put them on the slave patrol and said, you get to help us keep those people in line. You get to be our eyes and ears. You get to be ice in the 1600s. See? You get to be the folks guarding the borders of this new club that you're a member of now. Isn't that exciting? And these poor white folks were like, yeah. Well, oh, shit. I get a gun and a badge and a horse, whoa, sign me up, right? And so they put aside their class interests. They put aside the recognition that they had had of who they had more in common with because now they had what W.E.B. Du Bois, the great sociologist, would later call the psychological wage of whiteness, right? The ability to say to yourself, well, I might not have much, but at least I'm not black. And later on, I might not have much, but at least I'm not Mexican, or I might not have much, but at least I'm not native to this continent. Or I might not have much, but at least I'm not Chinese labor brought over here to build the railroads that created the transcontinental economy. I might not have much, but at least I'm better than somebody. And all of a sudden, those rebellions stopped because rich white people had convinced not rich white people that their enemies were black and brown. Fast forward to the Civil War era, same thing. So I'm from the South, if y'all hadn't figured that out yet. And... In my part of the world, my people now, in the narrowest sense of my people, now I'm talking about my white folks from the South, will insist to you that the Civil War, oh, it had nothing to do with slavery. Oh, my goodness, no. It was just states' rights. They're just fighting for, I don't know what right they think they were fighting for. Was, it, was, was Kentucky arguing with Massachusetts about the proper way to smoke a pork butt? Like, what was the argument? Was it like, y'all are making mint juleps the wrong way. This is the right recipe. That's not what they were fighting about. The only argument they were having, the only right that the South was fighting for was the right for its rich people to continue owning Africans. That was it. They admitted it at the time. They, didn't, they hadn't no shame about it at the time, so they were willing to admit that was it. But the thing is, if I'm going to break away from the Union and go to war to fight to preserve enslavement of people, how do I get poor people to go fight for that? Because, you know, I'm rich. I own people. I ain't going to go fight for nothing. Rich people don't go to war. Rich people get poor people to go to war, whether it's during the Civil War or whether it's right now. Rich people get doctors to write notes insisting they have bone spurs so they can't go to Vietnam. That's what rich people do. If y'all don't know who I'm talking about, Google that shit later on today. All will become clear. Rich people don't fight their own battles. They get poor people to do that. But if I'm poor, why would I go to fight to protect your property interest in slaves? That's weird, right? That'd be like me calling somebody who was poor. It'd be like me, you know, going down, finding somebody at the homeless shelter in Nashville being like, look, I hear there's a military invasion on my block. It's going to start in about a week. I do not feel like fighting for my own shit, but I would really appreciate it if you would come and defend my home against the invading hordes. And then that person would be like, sure, why would they do that? That wouldn't make, even if they liked me, they'd be like, yeah, no, you got to fight for your own stuff. I'm really not going to do it. But the poor in the South 
were told by the rich, oh, you got to go do this. Oh, my God, because you know what? If, if the Yankees win and, and the Africans are freed, oh, they're going to take your job. They're going to take everything you have. No, fool, they already have your job, right? They already got your job. Think about it, right? Because if you're white and you have to charge the landowner to work, let's say it's like a dollar a day or two bucks a week. I don't know what it was at the time. But if you got to charge and they can get the African to do the work for free because they own them, guess who got the gig? Free got the gig. So in a sense, like if you're wage labor, you'd have been better off getting rid of the system of enslavement, teaming up with those who were enslaved to overthrow the aristocracy and get a better deal for all working people. But these rich folks were like, oh, you got to remember what team you're on. You got to stop them. They'll take your job. They'll take your wife. They'll take your land. They'll take everything. And they're, oh, my God, yeah. You know, and so they go and hundreds of thousands of these white poor people die fighting for white supremacy and a system of enslavement that in the long run actually hurt them in economic terms. Fast forward to the labor union movement, same thing happens. You got white union leaders. They're not even the elite. They're just the elite within the labor movement, right? They're not the rich, but they were actually willing to keep their labor union separate and segregated because they said, oh, we don't, want, we don't want black people in our union and Chinese labor in our union and Mexican labor in our union because that'll reduce the professionalism of our craft. No fool, it'll double the size of your union. Which the next time you go out on strike, that might be helpful, right? Because A, you want more people on the strike line. And B, if you don't have those people of color out there with you, guess who the boss is going to hire to replace your ass when you're out on strike? They're going to hire the black and brown folks. And then instead of getting mad at the boss, you'll get mad at who? The black and brown folks and take it out on them for taking my job. Fast forward to the present. And we've heard that line before. See, nothing's new under the sun. Nothing about... Trumpism is new, rich white guy telling not rich white people their enemies are black and brown. Now we hear it with immigration. Oh my God, we got to build this wall because then if we just build the wall, all the jobs will come back. For real? Is that how you think capitalism works? <laughs> is that what you think? You think the bosses of America are just sitting around right now going, holy shit, I hope they don't figure that thing out about the wall. Because if they just figure that out, we're going to have to give everybody a big fat raise. No, that's not how capitalism works. You could build a wall theoretically tomorrow. Not really, but theoretically, you could build a wall. But capital is going to keep jumping borders, right? Capital doesn't stop. It's not like it's a firewall in cyberspace. It's not like rich folks are going to want to move their money to a Cayman Island bank account, but the wall is going to stop that shit. Like, transfer money. Boop. Oh, shit, I can't do that. I didn't know. Like, that's not what happens. The wall doesn't stop capital. Capital keeps moving wherever it wants to under capitalism. And goods, they're going to keep moving, right, in search of the highest price. You can sell goods across borders. You can move capital across borders. If you're allowed to do that, but you can't move labor across borders in search of the highest wage, if labor is trapped, even as capital is mobile, guess who wins? Every time capital wins because labor is chained to its country of or origin and capital can go wherever it wants. That rigs the game against working people. And not just working people south of the border, but working people north of the border who are now deprived of the bodies that could have collectively fought for a better wage and working condition for all working people on the continent. But they can't do that now because they're kept from one another by this dumbass wall. But if you tell people, oh, that's going to be the key, and people believe it had this young man write to me, and he said, I, young white dude said, I can't get a job because black people and Mexicans are taking all the jobs. Really? All the jobs? <laughs> all of them? That's crazy because black and brown folks are twice as likely to be out of work as white folks. So I don't know where these jobs are. Like, they, they're in Second Life or some shit. <laughs> right? They're, they're on Minecraft digging a tunnel. or so. I don't, I don't know where the hell these jobs are. If black and brown folks are taking them, they're not taking them far. Take them about a block and a half and like, yeah, done with that. Right? But he was convinced. And he was all excited to vote for Trump. He said, because he's going to build the wall and then I can get a job. What kind of, you know, he believes that. And, and I understand maybe he is out of work. And he makes that assumption because that becomes an easy recipe, an easy target, an easy scapegoat. Right? If I tell you that, then we don't have to deal with what globalization really is about which is about rich, almost always white folks able to move their money around from the global north to the global south, right, in a way that takes advantage of 
lack of worker protections, lack of minimum wage protections in those other countries. So rather than joining in solidarity in a global labor movement that would fight to raise wages and working conditions for all workers, we just get pitted against one another while the rich folks continue to make off with the money. Right, right now we got 37 people in this country, 37 who have the same amount of wealth in their pocket as the bottom, as the bottom half of the American population. That's 165 million people. 37 people over here, 165 million over here, they got the same amount of stuff. Does anybody actually think there are 37 people that have worked collectively harder than 165 million people or that are just that much smarter than 165 million people? Of course not, right? That's the problem. Mexicans ain't responsible for that. Black folks ain't responsible for that. People of color generally not responsible for that. Poor people not responsible for that. But if we can take people who are struggling, whose pain is quite real, and make them think that the reason they're in pain is these people over here who are also in pain, right? then they'll just fight each other over the pieces of a pie that neither of them own. But just understand that when that happens today, that's not new. That's the same thing that was going on in the union movement. It's the same thing that was going on during the Civil War. It's the same thing that was going on during the colonial period. Right? But there's one other problem. And that is that this culture of cruelty that we're seeing an uptick in right now, the cruelty aimed at immigrants, the cruelty aimed at poor people generally, the cruelty aimed at people who were at the bottom of the economic ladder, this idea that they're to blame for why they are there. And so we keep saying, well, if you're going to receive any kind of government benefits, by God, you got to work for them. Now, that's not true, apparently, if you're a Wall Street banker. We don't put any requirements on you. So we can bail your ass out when you tank the economy. We're not going to drug test you, right? We're not going to, we're not going to racially profile the Wall Street bankers, stop their cars on the street, stop them in their Lexuses or Lexi, whatever the proper plural form of that is and pop the trunk looking for drugs or evidence of financial impropriety. You know, we only save that kind of treatment for the poor, for the working class, for the people on the bottom. But by God, if you receive any kind of nutrition assistance or if you receive any kind of government subsidized health care, oh, well then we've got to drug test you and we've got to make sure you work because the assumption is you must be lazy or you wouldn't be in that position. Forget the fact for a minute that the vast majority of people receiving forms of public assistance are either children elderly people, disabled people, none of whom are generally expected to work, right? Or they are people in homes where somebody already does work but does not make enough money to get above the poverty line. That's the vast majority of folks, but most people don't believe that. We have this impression, people just sitting around on the sofa getting a check from the government. Do you know how many adults in this country currently receive cash welfare? from the government actually get a check, people would say, oh, it's 20%, 50%, 30% of the population. There's a million adults in all in the whole country out of over 200 million adults in all, about 1 million actually receive cash welfare. Right? And yet we have this stereotype because politicians have played upon these fears and these assumptions and turned us against one another. Right? And that's not new. That's not something Donald Trump invented. It's tapping into something that's very fundamental to the American ideological experiment. But we don't want to admit that it's fundamental. We like to think that it's just those people who push those buttons and use those narratives. But actually, it's something deeply embedded in the American experiment. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. I'll tell you a story to make the point. Right? Um, a couple years ago, I was driving our daughters from school to dance. They're both dancers. They were in a dance company in downtown Nashville. And uh, so we were driving from the school to the studio one day after class. And it's a drive that we made most school days uh, every week. And we've been making this drive for like a year at that point. And it's about an eight minute drive, about halfway between the school and the studio. We got stopped at a red light, happens to be in the middle of public housing in the city of Nashville. And even though we'd made that drive pretty much every day, this was the first time that my 10-year-old daughter at the time, whose name is Rachel, decided to ask a question about the neighborhood. I'm sure she had noticed the demographic mix of the neighborhood, who lived there and who most certainly didn't. And I'm sure she had noticed the condition of the neighborhood in terms of its infrastructure, right? But she'd never asked anything until that day. And that day she said, as we're waiting at the red light, Daddy, why is this neighborhood pretty much all black? And I thought to myself, well, now that is one hell of a good question, 
I thought to myself, in fact, holy, holy hell, my, my 10-year-old is doing urban anthropology in the back of my Highlander. That's, that's incredible, you know? And I was really excited because, you know, as a parent, if you are a parent, you know, there are times your kids will ask you questions and you have no earthly idea how to answer them. That happens a lot with me. Like if my kid asks me, where does electricity come from? I'm going to be like, Psh, didn't y'all cover that in science? <laughs> You're supposed to know that. You tell me. I don't know. What do you think as I'm Googling it, right? I don't know. <laughs> but the one question that you can ask this guy that I actually know the question to was probably that question. So I was very excited because I'm about to show off all that I know in front of my 10-year-old. And you got to take your victories where you can when you got a 10-year-old. So she asked me, why is the neighborhood all black? I'm ready. I know this. I know this. I got the answer. It's right here about to come up. And then something happened. I didn't know what happened. I did not know it because I am an only child. But apparently, if a 10-year-old child asks a question in the presence of the older sibling, a question posed to the parent, the older child will inevitably, and without much hesitation, make sure to offer their own damn answer just to show off how smart they are. So remember the question, 10-year-old says, Daddy, why is this neighborhood pretty much all black? Daddy is ready with the answer. The 12-year-old, whose name is Ashton, preempts my answer by saying, redlining, to which I went, what? Because if you don't know that word, you will in a second. That was an uncannily accurate response. I looked at her like, do, do you just know stuff? Like, <laughs> did my wife and I give birth to like a sociological savant? What the hell was that? Actually, who am I kidding? My wife and I did not give birth to anything. My wife, did she give birth to a sociological savant? What in the world is going on? Right, and the 10-year-old says, I don't think I know what that means. I said, yeah, I don't think your sister does either, but <laughs> that was a hell of a guess, right? And I knew I had about three minutes until we were going to be at the studio, so I didn't have a lot of time to go into the PhD-level version of the answer. But she got me off to a good start. Now, to be honest, she's not quite right. When she says redlining is the reason, that's not actually the reason that the neighborhood is black. It is the reason that it's poor, and I'm just going to give her credit on this as a good, that's half right. I'm going to give her some slack. She was 12. Just so you don't, if you don't know, redlining was the practice that banks um, engaged in very openly. It still happens, but it was very open for generations where they would literally put maps on the wall in the loan office, and they would take a red marker, and they would mark around the outlines of poor neighborhoods that were black in particular. Occasionally, also, they would do uh, poor Latinx neighborhoods, and even occasionally poor white neighborhoods, but rarely, usually black and brown. And anybody who lived within the boundaries of that red line was not going to get a loan from that bank. It didn't matter if you had good credit, didn't matter if you had a good job, didn't matter if you made good money, didn't matter if you had a good education, just didn't matter. You just were going to be shut out of capital. So as a result of that, you starve a neighborhood of capital right, and it becomes poor. The reason it became black was because at the very same time that black folks in the city were being starved of capital, white folks who used to live in the city were being subsidized to leave the city, right? First, they were subsidized by the FHA and the VA loans that were created in the 1930s, which allowed them to move to the suburbs and the outlying towns at a time when black and brown folks were routinely excluded from those spaces, right? So they were able to escape the congested and crowded cities and move to the suburbs where the jobs were increasingly going, right? And where the trash got picked up twice a week and where the schools were better funded while black and brown folks were trapped in the city unable to move to those spaces. So the government was literally subsidizing white flight with government guaranteed, government underwritten loans and trapping black and brown folks in the city by virtue of either no Fair Housing Act yet until 1968 or even after the Fair Housing Act was passed 50 years ago this month and went into effect uh, ongoing discrimination, which the data says still happens, two and a half to three million instances of race-based housing discrimination every year in this country against people of color even today as I speak. So that's how the neighborhood became black and that's how the neighborhood became poor and now we were at the studio and I dropped the kids off and I asked them if that made sense to them, and they said they understood, and it was very disturbing, and then they got out, and they went in, they did their thing. And as I was pulling away, I was both pleased with myself for being able to break this down in terms that the 10 and 12-year-old, you know, would understand in an age-appropriate way, but I also had this feeling of terror wash over me, right? Because think about what happens if I don't know the answer to the question. Think about what happens when other parents don't. 
know the answer. And let's be honest, how many white parents wouldn't know the answer? See, black and brown families tend to know a little something about it because they lived that history. No, don't always, they don't always know the details, but they got a little sense, right, that something happened that explained the way the neighborhood came to be and the way the neighborhood came to look. But for a lot of white folks, we didn't learn about that because why would we? It wasn't in our schools. They didn't teach us that. Hell, I took AP history. That's the history for the smart people. That's what they tell us, right? But they didn't include any of that history in there. I had to learn that later. So how many folks, even really well-educated folks, well-intended folks, just wouldn't know the answer? And then if their kid asks, and the parent doesn't know or tries to change the subject, as we often do when race comes up. It's like, oh, look, a bird. You know, just anything to get our attention off of the obvious, right? Then what do you think that child does? Do you think that 10-year-old just like says, oh, okay, well, I'll stop wondering about that now? No, they're going to keep wondering. And they're going to come up with their own answers, aren't they? And what answer do you think they're going to come up with? The only answer that they can come up with, it's the one the culture taught them. It's not the one Donald Trump taught him. It's not the one David Duke taught him. It's not the one that any overt racist taught them, but it's the lesson that the culture taught. What was that lesson? You know the lesson as well as I, because it's a lesson we were all taught. It's the one thing that connects every one of us in this room, regardless of race and culture and ethnicity and socioeconomic status and geographic region from which we come. If you were born in this country, or even if you weren't, but if you've been here for more than a minute, the one thing you were taught that we all were taught was what? That in America, by God, you can be anything you want if you're just willing to work hard for it. So wherever you end up is all about you. It's all about your effort, which means that if we grow up thinking that and not interrogating it and not knowing the history that I just offered to my children that got in the way of that, if we don't create a sociological imagination in the child who's raised with that mythology and that ideology, they look around and they see certain folks down here. And the culture says, well, you know why they're down there. Because if they really wanted it and worked hard and had any skill, they'd be up there. So if they're down there, it's their own damn fault. They should have tried harder. And those rich folks, those 37 people, those folks on the Forbes 400 list, right? Those 400 white folks right now, 400 white people in this country have the same net worth as all 40 billion, I mean, excuse me, 40 million black people combined. 40 million black folks in this country, and they have the same amount of stuff as 400 white people. And I mean all black folks combined. I mean even the ones you think got a lot of dough, right? Oprah, yeah, she's in that mix, still doesn't change anything. Jay-Z, yeah, he's in that mix. Beyonce, she's in that mix. They're in that mix. Doesn't matter. 400 white folks, same amount of stuff as 40 million black folks. And so the culture says, well, that must be because those black folks just aren't as good. They're not as capable. They're inferior in some way. So even if you never teach a child that, if we teach people that where we end up is all about us and we don't interrogate that and actually fill in the blanks and explain the things that we're seeing with reference to history and the actual opportunity structure, racism becomes a default position. Sexism does too, right? Because you see women disproportionately down here. You see men disproportionately up here. You come to conclude that, well, I guess, I guess the men are just smarter. They just, they just work harder, right? You see poor folks down here. You rationalize their poverty and you rationalize rich folks' affluence. You see folks with disabilities down here and able-bodied folks disproportionately up here and you go, Psh, well... You know, you see any non-dominant group, any marginalized group in society, LGBTQ folk, anything, you see marginalized folks and you rationalize their marginality. And the reason I'm telling you that is that that culture of cruelty that the current political moment has tapped into, if we don't understand it as just a continuation of what's always been, if we treat it like it's something unique, then we can just sort of wait it out. Right? We could just be like, okay, we got to fight it, but eventually this will pass. Right? This will pass. Just give it a little while. This will pass because history runs in cycles. Yeah, but this history has not ever run out. Right? The cycle just changes, and it looks a little different from time to time, but that mentality has been operative for hundreds of years. And if we don't push back on it, we end up justifying in a lot of people's minds that inequality. And once you've justified the inequality that exists, Right? and you ignore the context that actually brought it about, you never fix it. You're not going to fix a problem that you don't even define as a problem. Right? And so that's why it's so important that we have a better understanding of this. And let me tell you something. It's not just bad for the people on the bottom. Ultimately, it's even bad for most white folks. 
And this is the dirty little secret of inequality, right? Sometimes if you're on the upside of inequality, you might think to yourself, well, at least I'm winning. I get it, because we live in a culture that places a big premium on winning. So even really compassionate people, let's say compassionate guys that you know, don't like sexism, but they sort of like the perks of sexism in the job market, right? They sort of like the advantages that we get from it. Or white people that are very compassionate, they don't like racism, but they sort of like having those advantages in the job market or better treatment from the cops or more housing opportunity or better schools. Um, even those folks oftentimes end up getting hurt by this. What do I mean by that? Well, here's the problem. If you live in a society that tells you wherever you end up is all about your own effort, as long as things are going good for you, everything's fine, right? As long as you got that good job with those decent benefits, everything's fine. And maybe that's how it goes most of the time. But now we got this global economy in which an awful lot of white folks are finding themselves, what, out of work, staring down the barrel of 55 years old, just about five to 10 years away from retirement, wondering what they're going to do because now their pension is gone, their retirement savings are gone, they can't afford health care, they can't afford their kids' college education, and the jobs have moved overseas because capital's always moving, capital's always moving, wall or no wall, deportations or no deportations, ice or no ice, capital will always move. You got these working class towns in Appalachia, rural Pennsylvania, all throughout the country, in California too, where you got white folks bitter about the fact that their towns are dying, and for a while, they'll try to put that off on somebody else because after all, they're being told it's the Mexicans or it's the globalists or it's whatever it is. But at some point, you got to remember the voice in the back of your head too is actually there telling you what? Wherever you end up is all about you. Remember, that's what we taught you. We've all been told that. We can try to deflect it and project it onto somebody else, but that voice in the back of our head is actually making us wonder what's wrong with us. So if you want to understand the opioid crisis in white America right now, you better understand this. Why do you think that this crisis has so disproportionately hit white folks in small towns in rural America? Why? What's the logic behind that? See, it doesn't make sense in some ways. They keep talking about this as, you know, it's deaths of despair. These people are in such pain, such despair that they, they're killing themselves. I get that. But now if you look at any of the indicators of well-being, black and brown folks are actually worse off than white folks, even though there are millions of white folks struggling, black and brown folks far worse off in every single indicator of well-being. So if white folks are killing themselves out of despair, why aren't black and brown folks doing that in the same number, in the same percentage? There's only one possible answer, and that is the black and brown folks always knew the system was a joke. The black and brown folks already knew that it was a sham and a setup and a scam. Right? They already knew that it wasn't really about them. But see, white men, we have been told all of our lives that as long as we were strong and were willing to lift stuff and had a good back, that we would always have work. Black and brown folks never took that for granted because they couldn't. People of color could never assume there would always be jobs for them as long as they were willing to work. But a lot of white men could, even those white men in the coal mines. Right? That's not an easy job, and it's a job that you can get a disease that'll kill you by the time you're 55 years old. It's hard work. It's difficult work. Nothing sexy or exciting about it, but at least those guys in those communities, they could believe that as long as they were willing to go into that mine and do that work, that they'd always have a job. And now you find out that coal mining isn't really economically efficient anymore. The world is turning away from coal for reasons both economic and environmental. But your whole economy was set up on that premise. And you were always told, hey, you might not ever become rich, but you'll at least always have horizontal mobility. As in, my granddaddy worked in the mine. My daddy worked in the mine. I'm going to work in the mine. Or my granddaddy worked on the assembly line. My daddy worked on the assembly line. I'm going to work on the assembly line. Or my grandfather was a farmer. My father was a farmer. I'm going to be a farmer. And then the corporate farms and corporate ag come in and take the land right, and run a lot of family farms out of business. If I'm the guy that was always told to believe in my country, and I was the one who had the luxury of doing it, if I was told that the system was fair and just, and wherever you end up is all about you, and I was the guy who had the luxury of believing it, then when it all goes to hell, I'm the guy who doesn't know how to cope with it which is to say that this system of inequality, which damages people of color so badly, also sets up white people for a fall. As long as everything goes well, it goes well. But the minute it goes to hell, we're the very ones for whom preparation for this never seemed necessary. 
right? We're the one group that was least prepared for the recession. We weren't the hardest hit by it. The data says, for example, black folks lost two-thirds of their wealth, right, and almost all of their housing value collectively during the Great Recession. And yet, even though they're in worse shape and lost far more in objective terms, when you look at some of the survey data, black folks are more optimistic about the future than white folks are, right? Black folks who were twice as likely to be unemployed, three times as likely to be poor, one-fifteenth the net worth, seven years less life expectancy, but they're like, all right, we just got to keep plugging away. White folks who have half the unemployment, one-third the poverty rate, 15 times more wealth, and live seven years more on average are like, oh, my God, the whole wheels are coming off of this thing. We're running into the ditch. How does that happen? It happens because the privileged group, the dominant group, has the luxury of expectations. Right? And when you drive my expectations up to this and you tell me, hey, as long as I play by the rules, I'll have a seven or better on the scale of life on a one to ten scale and now I'm only at a five. Oh, hell no. What do I do with a five? But if I was somebody who always knew that a seven was going to be a grind, I was going to have to really bust my ass to get to that. And I'm already at a five. I might be like, Psh, all right, I just got to keep working. Right? I might actually have a better attitude about it. So in a way, inequality is not just harmful for the people who get kicked in the teeth every day. Inequality is dangerous for everyone because you never know when it's coming for you. And we got millions of folks right now for whom it has come, and they don't know how to deal with it, so they turn to opioids or they turn to a political opiate named Donald Trump because that's really what he is if you think about it. What is an opioid? Think about it. Pharmacologically, what does it do? An opioid only has one purpose. It blocks pain receptors. That's the only purpose it has. It doesn't fix your problem, though. It just blocks the pain receptors so you don't feel your problem as acutely, right? If you slip a disc in your back, they'll give you opioids, but you're probably going to need surgery, right? The opioids don't fix it. If you have cancer, they'll give you opioids to get over the pain, but it does not get rid of the cancer. You're going to have to do some other stuff for that. By the same token, a man coming along and telling you that a wall will solve the problems, that getting tough on this group and that group and keeping refugees out, that that will solve your problems, that's a political opiate. That's someone who's saying, I see your pain, and I know how to take it away, even if only momentarily. And when millions of people fall for it, it isn't just dangerous and it isn't just pathetic. It's destructive to the fiber of the country and the ability of this country to pull out of a culture of cruelty by recognizing the commonality of purpose that the vast majority of us have. Maybe not those 37 people. You know, those 37 people with all that wealth, they're going to do what they're going to do. And I don't necessarily expect them to get on board radically transforming the society. But for the vast majority of us who aren't them, and I'm going to take a wild guess that none of us in this room are them, right? We have a lot more to gain out of solidarity and unity and fighting back this history of divide and conquer that has worked so perfectly to keep us fighting with one another once again over the pieces of a pie that not one of us in this room own and probably that none of the people that you know anywhere in the world actually own. So we have a decision to make and it's a decision for which our children and our grandchildren will judge us either kindly or harshly. The choice is up to you. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate it. so much. Um, so Tim will be out in the front lobby. If you would like to stop by, you will have books and DVDs there for sale. And then at 145, there will be a reception over in the Student Activity Center in Bertolini, and you're welcome to come and, and meet and greet Tim personally. Um, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. <laughs>